All right, we'll go ahead and get started. Thank you for everyone, for everyone online as well, for joining us. Um, I, so first off, it's Dr. Mark Winchell from the University of Washington. Um, he and I have been colleagues for a very long time, and I'm extremely excited that he um, took up our, our, our invitation to come chat with us today. Um, a couple quick things before I kind of get back to the, a uh, couple quick things before I get back to, uh, to introducing. Um, right afterwards, we're going to head over to Mother Road for a happy hour. So if you want to continue the conversation, please join us um, when we get over there. And then two, for those of you who are online, um, I'll monitor the chat once we get around to kind of questions at the end and, and be able to help moderate that for you as we get going. Um, there are, I'm going to embarrass you for a second. So if you need to stand over there, it's just, it's fine. Uh, there are very few people who have had, a, a, in my opinion, a larger impact on the field of science education, especially science teacher education, than this guy right here. Um, so much of the work we do one floor up in science teaching and teaching new teachers um, comes from the work that Mark has done over a, a really spectacular career. And when I heard that he was going to turn his focus to thinking about what how to teach climate change, um, I got very excited because there are so very few people who can do the empirical work and then communicate that back out to practitioners and to the general public like Mark can. So it was very exciting to, to see that him pack his back on this topic. Um, so please join me in welcoming Mark Winchell and I hope for hope they have a wonderful discussion. Thank you, Dr. Thank you, Rob. And I just want to say thank you for the invitation to be here. I'm super excited to share ideas with you and I hope we can have a conversation and we can leave time at the end for conversation because I think that's where a lot of um, a lot more and more different kinds of engagement happen. So um, I'm imagining that everybody here is interested in the topic today. And if you are, then you are perhaps on the edge of trying something with regard to climate change teaching that you haven't done before. And that's where we are collectively uh, in education. Climate change teaching is really uncharted territory. And I know, I, like Rob said, I'm a specialist in research and background of lots of dimensions of science education. And I know that climate change teaching is understudied, under theorized, and so, it makes what many of you are going to do more exciting. Uh, I call it taking the leap. And for some of you, you may be thinking about taking uh, a modest leap in your teaching, maybe adding a module to the end of a unit of instruction that you're teaching. We were talking about teaching a unit on the Yellowstone ecosystem and then adding on a module about the pine bark beetle and how it's decimating that ecosystem uh, by wearing down the pine trees in that habitat. And then that has downstream effects on the rest of that ecosystem. So that'd be a module. There are other kinds of things that some of you might be thinking about, like I'm gonna try to teach a full unit, which in my experience is like a five to six week set of con uh, connected lessons on the theme. So maybe you're thinking about a unit based on climate change. Maybe you're thinking just, I am gonna have a conversation I've never had with my students before. Whether they're K-12, grad, undergrad, I'm gonna have that conversation with my students about climate change and their experiences with it. Maybe that's the week to do. So we're all in different places, but um, I think everybody can get something out of what I'll share today. Uh, what I'm sharing comes out of my own experience as a K-12 educator. Uh, it also comes out of the thousand days or so that I spent writing the book and reading intensively for the book, and I'm continuing to read intensively every single day uh, on everything you can imagine about climate change. But also, most of what I will present today comes out of my work with teachers and classes. So I've been working with third grade through seventh grade, ninth grade, 
um, working with two teachers in LA who are doing, they're really taking off a big chunk of stuff. They're doing a full interdisciplinary science course for juniors and seniors in the LA area high school. And it's ongoing right now, so we're in contact all the time about how is this going? They're teaching the unit on food waste. How, how is that going? They're communicating with some parents who are getting back to them about about just teaching the course and how their students are responding. How is that going? So if that's live and it's just energizing me to have contact with them every week, because um, not all that many teachers are doing this in the K-12 world. So uh, I guess my first message, if I can get this to work. Oh, it did change. Okay. My first message, message is that we can do this. And there's there's two questions that I think should guide our thinking about taking whatever leap we're going to take. And the first one is a question about how do we prepare ourselves in doing different ways, not just for the teaching, but also potentially in roles of professional leadership where we're working with other educators, organizing them, helping them get up to speed on climate change. And when I say new and different, I say, I, I mean by that, that climate change is not just a topic that you absorb into your pedagogical repertoire. It's, it's not like anything else. Uh, I'll explain a little bit more in a moment. The other thing we have to consider is, um, in all honesty, how do we not overwhelm ourselves? This is for K-12 teachers. This climate change, even though they may be, feel ethically compelled to to teach about climate change, it is one more thing that they're learning on their plate. Um, not quite so much as teaching uh, undergrads and grad school, but for K-12 teachers, this can crush them. And we, we don't want to we don't want to do that. K-12 teachers are trusted messengers. We know that from research that kids, families, community members, school board members believe that teachers um they they put a lot of faith in what teachers say, and and you know they have their kids for 180 school days a year, and that's a that's a long time to work with them, especially some of that is about climate change. Okay, so I'm going to talk about two out of these four pillars. Uh, the first pillar about how do we prepare ourselves is figuring out where does my teaching fit in the larger picture of climate change. The second pillar is what about solutions? How do we, we talk about something that's understudied. Almost nobody is studying how students pick up this idea of solutions and what solutions are good for and how students learn to understand solutions versus the problems they're solving. There's no research on the trajectory of how kids learn about solutions, whether it's mitigation or adaptation to climate change. The other two, uh, so I have time for those, I don't have time for the other two, but they're super important. How do I support my students' emotional well-being? This is one of the most widely researched uh, areas of climate change, climate change teaching and learning. Um, and students' well-being is compromised um, starting at age eight or nine. Kids start responding to surveys and individual interviews saying that they do feel something that could be called ego ego anxiety or ego grief. And then of course they study most young adults up to age 24 and the results are, are all uniformly the same. Students, young people feel anxious about their future. And then fourth, we won't get to this one unless we want to talk about it in the discussion after I'm done. And then, then both of these last two, uh, what are my curriculum options for designing for experience? Like how would I get started even thinking about introducing climate change. So as I said before, uh, the first pillar is where might my teaching fit in the bigger climate change picture and this caution that climate change is not just another topic. It is in fact a sprawling puzzle implicating the, nat the natural and the social world. But my feeling is always that a framework can help us understand the enormity and the inclusiveness of what counts as climate change. And so this is, I'm going to share my framework, how I wrap my head around climate change to prepare me to teach it. 
Uh, this is, I'm not expecting you to take up my framework, but it might, it might help. So if we think about the amplified greenhouse effect and what the average climate literate adult in America knows, they, they pretty much understand that human beings have been throwing up billions of tons of greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. And they know that this retains heat, the metaphor of the, the blanket that warms us up and continues to warm us up. And then most climate literate adults know that the warming brings record breaking weather extremes of all kinds, droughts, floods, hurricanes. And then the fact that these weather events are no longer the outliers, but they are becoming the norm over the long term, that means that this climate is shifting. Now, if you go out online and you take a look at climate change online courses, or you want to take an online course, this is what they'll offer. These ideas, and they also add in the ocean and dynamics of the ocean. And if you really circle around those things, that would be what climate, the basic climate change is, and a lot of online courses. And I know that because I'm helping to develop an online course for teachers teaching climate change with the American Natural History Museum in New York City, and so we're supposed to take them on that course. So, there's more to climate change than just that. There are what we call the downstream impacts on every system that life depends on. I mentioned the oceans before, and one of those downs, a number of the, those downstream effects impacts impact the ocean, in terms of its, its chemistry, its heating, the temperature of the upper levels of the ocean are literally off the charts. I don't know how many of you have seen graphics of how warm the ocean got last year, and it may break those same records again this year. Uh, ocean circulations are slowing down, sea levels are rising. I forgot the top the one you mentioned that first stress ecosystems are a downstream effect. The melting biosphere, and by that I mean the polar regions, glaciers, and altitudes are all feeling that the Arctic is heating up four times faster than the rest of the world is. Even the global commons, the quality of the air we breathe, is becoming complex. So, this also is included in my way of thinking about how a teacher should think about what might be included in teaching about climate change. And you'll notice that. If you're a K-12 teacher, this is an invitation for biology teachers, because there's life sciences involved, chemistry involved, physics involved. Typically in K-12 school, this is in the past, I don't know if it's, if it's the case now, but in past in the past 10 years, our earth science teachers and only our earth science teachers have been asked to teach about climate change because it was conceived of as just that. About 45% of teachers who don't teach about climate change, they give the reason that it's not in my area of responsibility. And I would argue that it's everybody needs to take a bite of the climate change. There's more to climate change. There's the human story, which absolutely has to be told. And I'm talking about communities and entire nations that are at risk. The terms risk and vulnerability should enter the vocabulary for K-12 teachers. Uh, make sure kids understand what that means. There's the spread of disease, and along with the spread of disease, there's the spread of psychological trauma. And we're reaching the limits of human, human temperature tolerance. I should say some of us are protected, some of us are buffered from the worst extremes of climate change and especially the limits of human temperature tolerance uh, because those of us in more affluent countries, particularly the global north, we are not going to be, we have ways to buffer ourselves from, you know, really warm temperatures. Other people in other places, particularly the global south, do not have those options. And instabilities of different kinds, like economic, political instabilities, um, are driving mass human migrations that are orders of magnitude larger in scale than anything we've seen. 
I would say if we drew a circle around all three columns in my mind, that that is climate change in terms of how a teacher might think about it and work with kids to understand different pieces of this puzzle. This is grim. This is ominous stuff. And it could easily send kids into a tailspin. Um, there's so many dark stories related to the events on the left side. However, the what's helpful is that the idea that the stories we teach can be grounded in solutions. And this is really important for us. Research is telling us a few things. And one is that if you ground units of instruction in solutions and not the problem themselves, then students are much more responsive to doing that, doing that intellectual work with you. So if we think about solutions, there are vast numbers of mitigation and adaptation strategies. Our no, I know our minds go to electric vehicles and wind turbines, but there are literally hundreds of other solutions, less well known. But we have to pull all the levers in order to make it a dent in the, you know, the idea of drawing down the amount of greenhouse gas in the environment. Also, in terms of solutions, what we do with our students is we address the root causes of environmental damage by talking about um, colonization, the idea that countries mostly in the global north. Um, hundreds of years ago, and it continues today, countries in the global north, more affluent countries, have taken advantage of exploited populations in less affluent, less powerful countries, particularly in the global south. So this is going on now in slightly different forms than it did 100 years ago, but it's still going on. This is extraction of minerals, timber, extraction, use of cheap, almost slave labor. These are actually the actual root causes of environmental damage, which actually happened. This goes all the way to here on the history line. And then there's the other thing that's powerful about teaching um, solutions is that taking collective action supports students' well being and supports their agency. So when you talk about solutions, students start feeling that there's hope, and that hope drives actual decisions to do something. And the research is showing that only collective action, when you start talking about what action can we take in this classroom and maybe expand that to impacting our school or our larger community, only collective action has a positive impact on students at that. Individual action does not. Something for us to bear in mind. So I want to tell a story uh, to make this more concrete because I'm talking in the abstract about ideas. I want to tell a story about a third grade classroom. And why am I talking about a third grade classroom? I have people in here teaching undergrad and grad. And but I think finding out what very young learners can do is inspirational and it helps us all recalibrate expectations for what can happen in later grades. So let's see what a third grade classroom can do. This was a, let me go back here. So this was a unit situated in the Amazon rainforest in South America. And it was about ecosystems, but the title of the unit was how do humans affect climate and living systems? That was the essential question that ran throughout the unit. Sorry. So this, this was an outstanding teacher. But it wasn't a special student. These are, I just want to let you know that kids were typical third graders. The teacher is an excellent designer of units of instruction. And she knows that students' engagement with big ideas and big questions, it rises and it falls over the course of a number of weeks that you're engaged in the unit. So she knows that she wants to keep engagement high. So she divides the unit into three themes. And these themes are, themes are purposeful. They build on one another over time. So exploring the climate and tropical ecosystems was the first theme. And she developed a series of lessons around that first theme. 
And so the first theme in the first few days was how do parts of this rainforest ecosystem work together? So the students are watching a video, and I'm in the classroom too. So the students are watching a the video. They see all kinds of animals, macaques, anacondas, spiders. I can't remember all the jaguar. But there was jaguar on the tree. It was a big hit with the kids. They're watching. They're watching all of these things that live in the Amazon rainforest, and teachers asking them to just identify what is in the ecosystem. That was the first question that they that they had. What is in the ecosystem? And later on, a couple of days later, the teacher starts asking students to think about how these species are interdependent. Not just animals, but other species, other you know, plants, animals, fungi, microbes, they're all interdependent. The teacher begins to help students understand this indigenous point of view that decenters human beings from the lizard, that we're decentering human beings as the center of everything. And what we're looking at is a complex ecosystem in which all living things engage in a kind of reciprocal relationship, interdependency with one another. It's a working system. And she wants kids to understand that, but she can't just tell them that. They got to figure that out for themselves. Then they move to this idea of, well, what climate is this that's enveloping this ecosystem? And does it matter that, that it's the tropical climate? Now, this is a little drawing here of a, of a student trying to make sense of a question like that. And that question there, he has got uh, a number of different labels for different kinds of organisms that you saw in that video. He's trying to make sense of how, how they all um, interact with one another. So when we get to the middle part of the unit, this also is about two weeks long, students are studying what I would call the magic of trees. They start by discussing how do scientists measure trees? What is possible to measure in a tree? I know all of us think about, oh, there's biomass. Third graders don't think that way. But they can come up with a lot of ideas about what might you measure in a tree and what would it tell you? What kind of questions can you ask? And this starts a whole, this, this starts kids talking and thinking about data. And the teacher gives them tons of data throughout almost, almost every lesson had data associated with it. And kids readily ask for more data. That was part of their classroom culture. They would see data about, you know, the average height of the trees. And kids would say, can we get? This data for tomorrow. And we've got a couple questions. So, how do scientists measure trees? Very simple. And then there, this magical thing about trees starts getting explored. And by magical, I mean that trees, it turns out, you find out that trees are habitats for a million other things. Other kinds of plants are in and are on trees, animals on trees, and other insects. Again, microbes, fungi. So trees are kind of magical in that they seem to be habitats in and of themselves. The other thing that's like magical about trees is they take up carbon. They, well, they take up carbon and they store it in their biomass. The other thing that's really interesting about trees in the kids' mind was they found out that if you take a core, if you take a borehole to a tree, you pull out a core, then you see essentially the tree rings. And you look at the tree rings and the thicknesses, and we all know you can tell what the climate was like. This is, you know, the type of climate that you had um, controls the width of some of these summer to winter, some of these winter to summer uh, width of the trees. And so kids are finding out that trees are just these magical things, and they're learning a lot from trees, and trees can tell them a lot. They're evident. It's evident this part of the unit was. We have evidence of the climate from long ago, and the evidence is pretty good. The last question here was hard for them to take because the teacher showed them the latter half of the video that she started in the first week. And the latter half of the video, in that, the camera goes up on top of the rainforest and it's down, so the drone is looking down. And a number of machines, heavy machines, appear on, from the top of the 
top of the screen are coming into the force. And they're laying down some kind of cutting devices out in front of them. And I, I was shocked when I saw it and heard it. It was just, it's, they just started to literally mow down the force. And you could, you could just hear the silence in the room after the kids had studied all these things about trees and they could just see them getting mowed down. And then a couple of days later, all this timber was piled in a big, in a big uh, pile and then they lit it on fire and burned. And so the whole middle of the unit was about trees and all the things that one could learn about trees. Here's the, one of the young girls in class looking at those boards that were taken, those boards from the trees. And she's teacher, the teacher is asking all the kids, make a point about what you see in terms of the, the climate trend, trends over the last few decades. Kids were all so interested, you know, but some trees in the Amazon rainforest are over a thousand years old. That's a thousand years of data about climate. This is the model that one of the kids were, was asked to draw in the middle of the unit. So they were asked to create like inputs and outputs from trees. And sometimes when you look at a kid's model, you just say, oh, that's cute. He's got a flower with a smiling face on the top. But if you study, if you study this model from this third grader, you could see that this tree is not just a passive object that's stuck in the ground. It is acting dynamically with its environment according to the student. The tree is, I don't know if you can see it from up there, but this tree is taking in moisture from the clouds. It's also giving off moisture through transpiration. It is taking in carbon dioxide and it's releasing oxygen, even though it's a little more complicated than that. That's how the student is active. That's how that student describes it. The tree is even interacting with the sun. And of course, you've got the tree rings here. You want to include that. Also, in the bottom left, this student has got an image of that you saw in the video. Trees getting all that timber and cut down trees, burning in the staff. And the student says that wrong, R O N G. He already has these seeds planted in his mind that there's something going on when you cut down trees and you burn them. Maybe he doesn't know everything about it, but he's the seeds are planted. Who cares for this land and how was the third part of the unit. So what did they study there? First thing is how did how do indigenous peoples care for this land? They had to learn what indigenous meant. And so they they talked about what 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 does it mean? These are people who have lived there since time immemorial. And how do they care for this land? They have special practices where the land becomes the environment becomes sustainable. The relationship is sustainable. And so the teacher introduces the idea of sustainability as sustainability of a relationship between people and the environment's world. They talk about engineering solutions that can help the forest. Um, and then they talk about how can we help the environment? And in the classrooms that I've been in, third grade, seventh grade, tenth grade, the kids can understand the science pretty well. When it comes to solutions, kids still offer some pretty uninformed solutions. Kids will talk about how can we help this environment? They will talk about like putting solar panels on the roofs of the, the, the homes where the, the indigenous peoples live. And somehow they think that that will help the trees. And so solutions is still a, a challenge to teach kids about. But also the teacher asks them about local forests and are there things that the students can do to support local forests to make sure they are sustainable and make sure that all of the organisms that make up that living system can continue to, uh, to, can, can continue to live together. This is one of the final activities that, that the students did. There is a there's a little storyline up here in a piece of commercial work about how plants and their surround, how trees and their surroundings work together in an ecosystem. And then they, on the other page, it's got what happens when those interrelationships are damaged. Again, an indigenous world is you're not wrecking the trees. You are breaking relationships between 
living parts of the living system. And so this was, by the way, this was a science class, but it was also integrated into farming jobs, which you could do at the elementary level. It's harder to do, impossible really to test in upper grade levels. So in early elementary, you can have kids write and read um, to, to a great extent while, while they're doing science. So you can see how much this meant a lot. There were third graders who write about an explanation for what's happening when a force, like when deforestation happens. So I said, you know, now that we see a finished unit, something that is designed, it makes me think uh, we could do that. That's not impossible for us to talk about climate change in ways that don't cover stuff up or leave huge, huge gaps in understanding. There's a way to do it even with third graders. Seeds are planted. I'm not making the claim that these third graders walked away with sophisticated, nuanced ideas of everything I've described, but seeds are planted. And the power is not just in this third grade teacher. The power is in the cumulativity when other teachers in that school take up similar ideas in a more sophisticated way or perhaps in a different context as the next year in fourth grade and then in fifth grade and so on and so forth until they reach imagine what they those students would be like by the time they reach you as as undergrads or graduates so my question is audience participation heard him talk what what climate change ideas did he wrestle with in this year turn him talk to your name yeah yeah well, they learned what to talk about. Oh, and uh, you got to look at the So it has a the indigenous people that carry the land, and then we draw that out. Okay, let's go back to the whole group there. Yeah, they're part of the day, so they've got to be brave. One idea that speaks to the whole group. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Well, yeah, you brought up the you know one activity that you felt um, wrestling with right and wrong, right? Valerie's perspective on our footprint on the planet, which I think is you know it goes beyond science level it's interpretation of our activities. Um, the idea of what do we value together? By the way, that is thought to be one of the best entry points you could use if you're teaching in a classroom where there might be skeptical students in there. If you teach in a conservative community, 
and you've got kids who question the science, one way to start a little bit of research based is let's have a conversation about what we value in the environment. Because no matter conservative, liberal ideology, or other kinds of worldviews, everyone values the environment for one reason or another. But to have that conversation puts people on a, com on a common footing that we do care about the environment in different, for different reasons, but we do care. And that's a way to start upping the skeptical class. Yeah, I was going to say we thought that the uh, concept was that you could mentally reduce the research. I was really important to understanding climate change, so you can use certain cascade effects and you just got to this thing. I made a list myself, and so these are the kinds of things I think about as a science teacher that. I didn't know there was a screen up there. <laughs> you see systems thinking up there? Yeah. That's super important. Systems thinking is positively connected to uh, taking action in the world. I don't know how this is related, but it is. Systems thinking and um, Related to taking action in the world, systems thinking is also related to. Yeah, we're going to get a statement for the moment. Uh, but system thinking turns out to be really important for kids, and it can start as early as first grade. Okay, so let me go on. Now, there, a question comes up about how do we deepen our own knowledge about something weird and we're going to take a risk teaching because it's new territory to us. So one thing that I found out from a thousand days of reading for the book is that nearly every story in the news or even in research papers, they all tend to fall into one of these five buckets. And they're either about the greenhouse effect or the Earth's radiation budget, about the carbon cycle, and I'm not talking about our parents' carbon cycle. The carbon cycle today is a, a different beast than it was back then. I mean, the scientific uh, it operates scientifically the same, but how we emphasize different parts of the carbon cycle is different these days than it used to be. Oceans in the cryosphere, that's another bucket. Temperature and weather extremes, often connected to this, that's another bucket, and weather versus climate. And then there's ecosystems. So if you are going to teach, you're not going to ever probably teach about all five of those buckets. You might just be teaching, let's say, about the carbon cycle. Um, so what I recommend is to do a deep dive into carbon cycles. Just read a lot about that. And just try to be do a more superficial reading in these other areas because you can't, you, you wouldn't be, it wouldn't serve you well as an educator if you knew a, a ton about carbon cycles, but nothing about the rest of these, especially how they might connect to the carbon cycle. And so a couple of key questions for each of these buckets are helpful. Here's an example. A key question. How does carbon now enter our atmosphere? There's all kinds of carbon in different forms. Like there's so many forms of greenhouse gases. It's not just carbon dioxide. And how they enter the environment from human activity is really something we have to look at. But that was rarely talked about or illustrated in carbon cycle diagrams in the past. The other 
generative question you can ask is how can we preserve carbon six? This is another thing the kids have got to get used to in terms of uh, language around carbon, that there are some parts of the natural world where carbon is sequestered, like in the biomass of plants, from below ground, in soils, especially peatlands, and of course, the, the oceans, without which we'd be doing this. So these are generative questions about the carbon cycle. Find the answers to those, and that you'll be well on the way to have a deeper understanding of the carbon cycle. Now, for those of you who want to access this PowerPoint, I have the PowerPoint and a PDF of it at, at, and, uh, available to you. And um, you, I have the generative questions for all five of those buckets later on, which I won't share today, but they're available to you. <laughs> now, if you want to learn about the rest of it, then you could. You could read some primers that are online, but one thing that I did when I was reading the book, I put on put in my earbuds and I looked at I listened to the podcast PIL Climate. It stands for Today I Learn, and it's run out of MIT. It is the best podcast I I heard about and I listened to. It has just they have scientists from MIT and other other uh, experts from around the world explaining some topic of climate change. And it's outstanding. The cool thing about PIL climate also is that if you tend to reach out to them, they have lessons and teacher guides for that particular topic. Like we were talking about the difference in the energy it takes to recycle plastics, uh, metals, and glass. And that was one episode. And it's really, they have really great teacher guides and lessons. Also, if you, I'm not hawking my book, but in my book, in chapter three, I go over all of these core ideas that you need to know when you do that. Okay, I'm gonna be very brief here about this. This is another way for us to see the big picture of climate change because of we've just in the last couple of minutes we've been talking about drilling down into some specific area. The big picture is, is you could do an activity like what's called climate press. Does anybody want to explain what that is? Because you just sat in on it. Half the people in this room were with me within the last time. Can somebody explain it? Because I need to get one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, it's basically uh, set the cards, you know, the cards each um, have different uh, text on the front, and then you flip it over and have a little bit more in depth on the back. Um, and basically, the task is to piece together a web or map or framework or however you choose to put it together. Um, to uh, explain how certain things are related to each other. And then at the end, there's like a solution card thing where you're connecting solutions to different climate issues. Um, I'm gonna try to time my slides. Oh, so Climate Press was developed in France and uh, it wasn't developed by educators for educators. So when I got a hold of the plant, the press car, press mean collage or mural in fact. And about a million people had done this activity, this climate change, or this, sorry, this climate press activity. And uh, so one of the things that I added were solution cards to this mix. And um, you can see this is another take, this is another image of how diverse solutions are. You've got things as familiar as electric cars, but also as different from them as plant rich diets and clean cook stoves. And of course, the whopper voting is, is one of the solutions. So I don't I don't think this is no, let's get back. Um, so let me talk, let me talk about solutions since we're on solutions, and then I'm gonna stop and we can have yeah, we can have a conversation. So very quickly about solutions. One of the, a couple of the ideas that students need to grasp when we talk about solutions is the idea of drawdown. Drawdown is that point in the future where carbon dioxide, the greenhouse gas concentration in the atmosphere, peak and then begin to go down. There are actually some places in the world, some countries where they, they, they have countries have already reached drawdown. We need the whole globe, you know, to everybody to reach drawdown and go, and go down. Um, once, once we reach drawdown, then we have a chance for what we call desirable futures. And we have to imagine desirable futures with our kids. 
because that's another thing about teaching solutions is the one thing it can do for kids is help them imagine what a desirable future would look like. And having those conversations with kids is really important, but it's a little risky for science teachers who don't do that kind of stuff. Like, let's say it's 2050. What is your day like if you were your age in 2050? You get up in the morning. What is it around you? How do you get to school? Where is school? Is school the same as it is now? Um, transportation. What does that look like? The food you eat. All kinds of things. So envisioning dire, desirable future is hugely important. Um, also, to understand solutions, kids have to understand a diagram like this. This comes off from Project Drawdown. So this is this is kind of like the new carbon cycle, well, not sand cycle, really. Um, you can see here, I'm sure you're all familiar with different sources from our different economic sectors for what percent of greenhouse gases get put into the atmosphere. And also, it helps kid, if kids understand that there are these things called sinks and that land is absorbed the whole planet, both in biomass and in the soil itself. About 24% of all the greenhouse gases. So that quarter is where that comes out. 17% goes into ocean and coastal sinks. And we know that these two numbers do not add up to 100%. And why not? Because 59% of that carbon stays in the atmosphere. Of all the stuff that goes in, 59% stays there and keeps going up. And some of you already know carbon dioxide stays in the circulation for up to a thousand years. Um, I highly recommend Project Rodan, um, Rodan.org online. This is their climate solutions library. And if you remember, I said how diverse the solutions were, not just the electric cars. These are, I don't know if you can see them up here. Take a look at all of them. Some of them probably are not familiar to you, but they're all different ways of keeping greenhouse gases out of the environment or their way to enhance the state. Um, another thing on Project Drawdown that I highly recommend is to educate yourself about solutions and how feasible they are and the technical nature of them, and but also the feasibility and the political dimension of getting them enacted. We're all hearing about how people are having a hard time in some places getting um, wind farms established in some places, both onshore and offshore politics involved in that. Um, anyway, Project Drawdown also has a place called Climate Solutions 101. It's a series of six videos and probably watchable by the average person who's just interested in climate, climate change. And these, these are, they have great examples in here. And of course, dynamic video. And they, they talk about complicated issues in a very accessible way. And I would say middle school students and high school students could watch the videos and learn from the videos, as well as teachers learning to do that, especially for the adults. Um, a note about how you represent solution. I would I would use graphics like this to show students about different categories of solutions. The project drawdown library of solutions is so esoteric and so so separate from students lived experiences compared to this um, I would choose your representation points these are these are solution categories that the kids can wrap their heads around like they'll look at the one that's labeled I don't know it's four number four cement kids are gonna say what is it about cement that is so much of a solution but they they know what cement is and it's helpful for them to then get curious about it. Um, just a word about my, my work with El Los, Los Angeles teachers. Well, no, I don't, I don't, I'm not going to say anything about Los Angeles teachers. This is their food industry. I'll just say that they got permission from the janitorial staff to get all the food waste in the cafeteria for one day and they're weighing all the food, categorizing the food waste. And the teacher, Realize that kids were asking questions, some of which were scientific, and some of which were socio-political. These were questions that came up during class. Teachers did not have to copy. And so the teachers decided to create a jam board. And so these are scientific, these are science technology questions, and these are social, political, or economic. 
And you can see it does compost and still emit greenhouse gases. Well, they tested that for the control of the experiment to see if a landfill condition is different than a compost condition. Uh, answered by science. This one, how can we lobby or protest for the enforcement of better policy and food waste? The kids were interested. The teachers are bugging them about solutions have to be scaled. We, and they have to be collective action by us. No more individual solutions like using, using multi-use straws or changing light bulbs in your home. It's got to be collective and it's got to scale. And so kids, uh, kids are up to the challenge and they're talking about how can we do this in our school, change policies local in our school, in our district, and then just get one. So I think I'm going to stop there with the solutions. Um, I've been talking for 40 seconds. And we should just have a conversation. Yeah. Okay. okay. So questions or comments? Yeah. Yeah, regarding these schools, I'm from LA. Were they underrepresented schools or were they you know schools in the Vancouver area? So I would say this is an average suburb in LA. It's not East LA. Is it? Yes. It's a little bit more middle of the road demographically, I should say. Okay. Yeah. That is important. Teachers teach about some possible solutions without including them. So I don't know exactly how these teachers, how the LA teachers are talking with them about solutions, but I think we have to do some, like almost like the reconstruction about different kinds of solutions and what those solutions actually do. Because one thing students are bad at generally is when they talk about solutions, mitigation or adaptation. They're all about talking about how those would be really helpful and we can scale that out. But they don't, they're not able to trace it back to what actually, what is its effect on greenhouse gases. So I would have them do an activity where they trace it back and say, we're going to cut down our food waste, dramatically cut down our food waste, trace it back through the food system and see what, what are we disrupting that is making a change. Students are not good at that, and this is the place for us for improvement. The other thing about both what you tell, we're talking about solutions here. Some kids come from home where the parents do not believe in the severity of climate change. The LA, the LA teachers for assignments have this bravery. They had their they had their students go home and interview somebody of another generation in their family, preferably family member, about climate change. And the, the two teachers teaching this class, they both have a class of 35 years course, and they showed me the actual um, transcripts that the kids had written up. And it was heartbreaking to see that the young girl writes, my dad doesn't think climate change is what's worse at all. And here she's in this class, hearing all about what's happening in the world. My dad and that's hard. They, I would say, probably one out of one out of five kids. Their interviews were with their own parents, uh, downplayed or completely denied climate change. You can either deny climate change, or you can accept climate change and deny its severity, or you know what's happening. This is uh, from uh, someone watching online today. So I wanted to ask if he has any suggestions about how to treat the families in different areas of the country that we want to be dependent on. It's kind of similar in terms of yeah. I would look up the term just transition. Yeah. yeah. It's uh it refers to 
people in West Virginia, for example, their economy is totally based on coal. Without a sorry, they're, they're, they are dependent a lot on, on the industry of coal. That's just jobs for them. I talk to people down in the south, and they're, they're like in Pennsylvania and then in the south, very dependent on other kinds of fossil fuels in addition to coal. And the, those industries talk about it. they can furnish jobs, they furnish jobs for decades, and they can keep furnishing jobs. And if you do things related to climate change solutions, you're talking about green energy, then you're talking about taking away our jobs. And so you have to make sure that everybody, everybody in a community, especially paying attention to those who are typically marginalized, have no voice in community decisions. Um, they, they can all come to the table to talk about how a community or a region or a state can go through a, like an economic, typically some economic transition. And who's good? You don't want anybody left out of benefiting from the transition from fossil fuel or fossil fuel economy to a green economy. It's complicated. I also had a related question, but um, I'll sidestep that part a little bit because you answered that. But I'm thinking about like informal learning settings, out of school settings. Are you aware of any resources uh, for for those kind of outside of school settings for either you know K twelve aged folks or older? I don't know about resources. I think that probably you would have to take the resources that are available for teachers and modify that for uh, informal or non-formal learning situations. I wish I had better news for it. Yeah. Well, I guess you also mentioned that podcast. Sorry, this just popped into my head, but just like science communication um, oh, yeah. is another avenue for this. One thing that you can do in informal to non formal education better than formal education is take kids outside. And, uh, you know, sometimes people think, oh, that's crazy. We're taking them outside. What do they learn from that? But what the research shows is that kids six years old and younger should not really be taught all these ominous things about climate change. It's a good track and too challenging for them to deal with six years old and younger. But what you can do with them is to help them under, get them out into the natural world and start conversations about what is out here. It's kind of like with the third grader, third grader, third grade teacher saying, what kind of living things are out here, both of, well, biotic and antibiotic part. And how do these things work together? What would, what would happen if we were damaged because of this environment? And the idea of, it's, it's a, again, it's an indigenous perspective to think about decentering the human being. And, at the same time, making the human being just another organism in a large system of living things and helping young children understand that nature is valuable in and of itself. And it's not there to extract all kinds of resources for human pleasure and the sense of self fulfillment. It's not what nature is for. Now, that all sounds like hippie, tree hugging mm -hmm. stuff, but it has been linked the idea of that nature. The biophilic viewpoint for young kids helps helps them, number one, with systems thinking later on, and they are much more amenable to understanding climate change and feeling like climate change action is worth doing in later grades. So what you do with sixth graders is not trivial. You can't talk to them about climate, but you can set the stage with that biophilic World, it really sounds like ideology, indoctrination. <laughs> and I'm sorry, it's five o'clock. Yeah, yeah. We should probably cut things, but we're gonna um, head over to Mother Road after this. So if you'd like to join us and talk more, please do that. Um, but please join me in um, thanking Dr. Hitchell. Thank you. 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 Watching this, <laughs> 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 yeah, 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 yeah